So most of you guys, including me, will be thinking, why are we not out driving at the minute? Well, having finally put all the suspension back together, uh, and the car back down on its own wheels, and it rolls around, uh, the brakes aren't seized, which is really good, um, it wouldn't start. So there's been quite a bit of mucking about and playing around and see if we can get this going offline, off camera, um, but no hope yet. So when I first started investigating as to why it wouldn't start, um, there was no spark to begin with. So got a new coil pack, that wasn't it. Uh, luckily this car has got a um, electric distributor, uh, electronic distributor uh, that replaces the old um, condensers and points. However, that was installed about 15 years ago, so I had to go buy a new one at 300 pounds. Here's the old electronic distributor. Um, unfortunately, it just stopped working. After 15 years, electronics does seem to, uh, uh, that seems to be the point that electronics dies. Um, and it's in pretty horrible environment down here in the engine bay um, with thermal cycling and all that sort of stuff. So to be honest, I'm not surprised that it's died after about 15 years. It is a pain in the bum because they are expensive. However, having installed my new 300 pound part, which should save the day, still no joy. Um, so you'll probably notice here, there's a big bit missing, which is where the carb and the intake sit. Uh, so don't think there's fuel going into the engine now uh, before the car got put up for winter uh, to do the front suspension yeah it was running pretty rich pretty horrible I knew the carb needed a rebuild anyway so that's going to be our next job is to rebuild the carbs and I know nothing about carburetors or rebuilding them or setting them up or any of that so <laughs> We're going to learn as we go. Having had a look online, there's two different kits that you can buy to rebuild these carbs. Uh, I'm not quite sure which one we're going to need. So now the carb is off the car and on the bench, we can start taking it apart, breaking it down, see which bits we need to replace, uh, and that'll tell us which kit we need to buy i.e. the cheap one or the more expensive one. So to start taking about the carbs, I'm going to do one at a time. So in case I find an issue with one or I can't remember how it goes back together, I've got the other one for reference. So it's always a good practice uh, if you've got two carbs to just do one at a time and considering I've never done this before, I think that's going to be a really good idea. So obviously you've got all the normal screws and screwdrivers and screws and screwdrivers, screwdrivers, Spanners, all that sort of stuff to take him apart. Um, I've got my, I haven't got a carb cleaner, but it's just a decoking, degreasing agent. So a uh, brake cleaner will probably do us just fine. Those of old rag. Of course, we've got our old socks. There's a whole drawer of them down here. Um, but I've also got loads of little, these are awesome, uh, little takeaway containers. So this is what they deliver us the, um, the pop dom dips in. Um, and it works really well. It's just a, a handy little container. Comes with a lid uh, if we need to store it for a while. Um, but yeah, having a load of those, super handy. Um, I've also got an old um, toothbrush just for getting in there and scrubbing off all the old horrible manky stuff that um, this guy is absolutely covered in. Uh, I think, I'm pretty sure all the bits on here are um, aluminium, uh, in which case I can put them in, I've got an ultrasonic um, bath, ultrasonic cleaner, uh, so that is awesome, but if you put, um, uh, so that is awesome, if you put um, steel stuff in there uh, with just water, when you take it out that steel stuff just rusts straight away, um, so I'm pretty sure it's all alley, it looks all alley to me, um, so those bits uh, I'll probably put in the cleaner just to get them extra nice and clean. Right, so let's crack on into it. So now that we got the carbon part, we could just fit all the service components 
and job's good. But we're not going to do that. We're going to give these guys just a nice quick clean uh, and a bit of a polish. So using some fine sandpaper uh, and then buffing off with a bit of aluminium polish and some buffers uh, just to get them looking nice. It's not going to be a show car this one so um, we do like a little bit of patina but these ones are looking pretty hammered. So uh, yeah we'll give them a quick clean and see how they come out. Okay, let's see what we get in the kit then. Of course, there's some instructions. Like any self-respecting man, we don't need those. Okay. So... Um, Amazingly, we managed to get away with using the cheaper kit. However, there was one missing that I needed, so I'm making it out of this old gasket. Works lovely. So back in the 60s, when Jaguar released the Mark II, there was three engine types. There was a 2.4, it was a little bit underpowered, one for the peasants. There was a 3.4, that was middle management, and a 3.8, that was chairman of the board. Our Jaguar Mark II is a 3.4, so I guess I'm stuck in middle management. So there's one interesting difference between the three engine types, uh, and that was auto choke, which is provided by one of these little things. So the 2.4 had a manual choke. Uh, once again, peasant class. You had to manually set your choke and figure it all out. Whereas in middle management and senior management, we just trundle along and this thing sorts it all out. Well, at least it should do. I think these were pretty rubbish back then and they haven't got any better. However, they're still quite an interesting piece of kit. So let's walk through it. So I've done a little bit of research into these guys and they're quite interesting really. They call them an auxiliary carb because this bit here pretty much is a mini carburetor. So where does it sit? We've got the float chamber that sits here. That's where all the fuel comes in. Uh, the main carb would sit here in the middle uh, and obviously this would hold all the fuel which then goes in to, to fuel the main carb. If we have a look, or if you see down the bottom there, you can see these guys are linked. So actually that float chamber is also feeding by this bit here, this carburetor. Uh, we can see at the top here that there's a little needle uh, and that actually does control a jet in there. So then it, there's this bit which is a little bit funky, what's he all about? So this is actually a solenoid that operates a valve. Uh, so it is driven by um, a thermostat or a rheostat or something like that that sits on the engine itself. So when the engine's cold, this um, solenoid will open or activate, energize, which will then pull the lever up or pull the, um, uh, the valve up, which would then allow uh, air, air comes in the top, sorry. So fuel coming through here mixed with the air set by this jet uh, and back through and into, and that then supplements the main carburetor. So, that gives us a little bit more fuel uh, and a tiny bit more air as well into the cylinder, um, which is effectively what I choke is doing, chucking a bit more fuel in there to help get it warmed up. Once the engine's all warmed up, that thermostat turns off this solenoid. There's a little spring in there, which sets down, closes that valve, and then you're just running off the two main carbs. Quite interesting, really. Um, trying to take this guy apart, because uh, I'm pretty sure this is why our car was running a bit rich before um, before we took it off the road, before we had to service all the carburetors. Uh, <laughs> I can't actually get it apart. So we're going to run it as it is, 
um, taking the top bit apart it doesn't look too bad so we'll we'll just put it all back together uh, with the new service carbs and see how it runs really so now that our carbs are starting to come together our book of words gives us two important jobs that we've got to look at the first being the selling of the butterfly valves so we do this by just making sure that there's a lot of play in there then closing her up tight and then pinching the bolts up easy as that our second job is setting the fuel cutoff for the float chambers and that's a little bit more in depth so let's have a look at that the manual calls for having 11 mil bar in order to be able to set this up now i don't know about you but i don't have an 11 mil bar just lying around to use so i went and raided the house what i found was this parker pen <laughs> and if we take a look uh, zero that guy sorry he's flashing he hasn't got much battery uh, so if we have a look it is pretty close to 11 mil given how they're describing on setting this up uh, I think that's going to be close enough so I've already set this guy up but the process that I went to go do it is we slip that bar in there and if he is only just touching then at this at this point here if he's only just touching this bar then he's all good so this guy and the other one is good to go all right guys we've finally managed to get these cars back together and they are looking great check them out nice and shiny still with a bit of patina i am super pleased now the proof is in the pudding uh, so the next job really is to get these fitted onto the car and um and get it set up and tuned from that now we did hit one little roadblock along the way which was this shaft here was actually bent so we had to take it from this bent one to this new one to this cut down one in order that we can do this um, um. <laughs> i'm really looking forward to getting this on the car so in the next episode that's what we're going to do so that's all for this episode i hope you enjoyed it if you did give us a thumbs up and consider subscribing and we'll see you when we get it bolted onto the car